Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled, So, to help certify fly-by-wire aircraft in the high-intensity radiated field environment, perf environment, we use a DC-3. Now, if you guys, my, my people who follow me for electrical engineering type of things, if you haven't all unsubscribed by now, I've, I've got one for you. I know I've been negligent. I've been talking about flight tests and airplanes and being a captain and stuff like that. And you probably felt that I've let you down because, you know, I haven't done anything for a while since the radar story and stuff like that. But this is for you. This is for you. Um, and, and here's the way it goes. Well, back in the uh, late 80s, the Airbus... Uh, 320 and other aircraft were, were coming uh, into the environment and, and they, they were being flown and people were getting concerned because these were fly-by-wire aircraft and you know like a lot of things uh, industry leads the certification authorities and there wasn't really good standards on well how do you certify these aircraft I mean we'd had military fly-by-wire aircraft but that's a very intense environment and they had been certified to very high values and it's well do we want to apply the same thing to commercial airliners, you know, how, do, how are we going to handle this? So that was an issue that needed to be addressed. And the SIE Technical Committee AE4 handles electromagnetic compatibility. Okay, well, they decided to put together a, a kind of temporary committee, AE4R. And I had come back from recall. I had worked, uh, the last thing I'd done is work for uh, Boeing as an electrical engineer. And I was lead engineer in the microwave technology group. And um, I was asked uh, uh, as an ELPA volunteer, Airline Pilot Association volunteer, if I would uh, send in on some of these meetings. Okay. So I went to the meetings. And there were a lot of good people, very intelligent people at these meetings. It was quite interesting. Well, the person who chaired the uh, main committee, AE4R, was a gentleman, a very senior program manager at Boeing up in Seattle, and I was in Wichita, but although we were, you know, at different uh, locations, we had known each other uh, because we had worked together, and I knew some of the FAA people um, because uh, we had worked on a few projects, and I'm, I'm kind of the the uh, odd man out here. All these people are engineers, and yeah, I'm an, I'm an engineer, but my main thing is I'm an airline pilot, and I'm I'm uh, was brought into this or asked to be involved because of my aviation background. And I could bring some, you know, real world, how do airplanes fly and, and how close can we get to various emitters and stuff like that. So I was bringing in some kind of real world uh, type of um, analysis to this whole thing. Well, it was kind of interesting when the two of them, uh, one of the uh, FAA guys, a boss, and um, the, uh, the Boeing manager approached me and asked me if I would be chairman of one of the three sub-panels. And the sub-panel was data accuracy. And this panel was to determine um, what, basically, what was the level of threat that the aircraft uh, needed to be protected against. Well, I was a little bit surprised by that. Um, I was just kind of there to, uh, you know, be part of the committee and, and watch what was going on. But uh, I ended up being chairman of this committee. And these are a lot of the people that I had on my committee. Uh, I still had their business cards in a file, but there, there was a number more. We, this, this thing went on for 10 long years, let me tell you. And, 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 and that's not even, um, it goes on farther than that. But my involvement in it, I was chairman of this panel for 10 years, and we had meetings all over the place. And typically how engineers work, uh, we had a meeting and then we'd have another meeting and we'd rehash this. And then we'd get a few new people on. So we'd rehash this again. We'll go over, well, what is the threat? How close can you come to these emitters and stuff like that? Well, uh, it was a, it was a, a fun bit of work. So, you know, there are a lot of emitters out there and a lot of them can be pretty darn nasty and you, you kind of want to avoid it. Now I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of those in specifics, but one thing that the committee decided was, well, let's go out and do some measurements because there's one type of emitter that we don't have a whole lot of data on. And that emitter is the over the horizon backscatter radar that uses three to 30 megahertz, which uh, uh, the Russians had these and these were used in the, uh, they've been developed actually since the fifties, but they were uh, used mainly in the eighties. Um, and I'm going to talk about the one we did. This is not it because I actually don't have any pictures of it, but it was uh, at Moscow, Maine, and it was uh, our over the horizon backscatter radar. 
Now, they used around the handbands. Now, the U.S. was nice. They didn't blast the handbands. The Russians didn't care, and they would uh, set their pulse radar right through the handbands. And uh, if you're a ham radio operator, you're very familiar with what we call the Russian woodpecker. Now, these antennas, uh, because they're low frequency, uh, kind of like some of the early uh, World War II radars, the arrays are very large. And these arrays are large, they're very massive, um, and uh, we decided uh, to get some information on it, like I'd mentioned, but the, the one I want to talk about is the Moscow main one, and it's kind of interesting. It, it went operational, I, I'm involved in this committee in the late 80s, and it came operational in 1990, but it was closed in 97 because, hey, the, uh, the Soviet Union uh, fell at the end of the Cold War, and uh, it wasn't needed anymore. Uh, how's that working out for you, Ukraine? You know, yeah. Well, maybe that might have been a little premature, but they have they have other methods of of doing this now, of um, of um, seeing what the other side is doing. Let's put it that way. But anyway, what we did was Ohio University, and here it is. They had a DC three, and this aircraft was equipped with test instrumentation. Um, that we could measure the field intensity in this frequency range as it was flown over. And uh, they decided uh, to set some uh, points. And uh, the main one they want to do is they wanted to fly over this at 500 feet because um, they figured that was as typically low as you could come to a structure, FAR-wise. So we went out and we flew over this at uh, 500 feet. Again, this isn't it. I don't have a picture. But um, see, I'm thought of as, you know, I'm okay, I'm the committee chairman in that and, you know, organizational skills and stuff like that, you know, and, and listening to these guys comment and talk about, you know, well, how close could an aircraft come to various things. Um, but we, we did this flight test and the kind of the neat thing about it is um, I had a fun time talking with the, uh, with the pilot and we're sitting down there with a the group one time and uh, he asked me about my background and uh, he said, well, is ALPA, the Pilot Association, paying you this? And I said, well, they give me, they, uh, they pay for meals. Uh, and some of the other engineers said, well, who pays your salary? And I said, well, nobody pays my salary. I mean, other than the airlines, this is a volunteer position. And that was kind of interesting. The engineers didn't actually realize that I was working for free. You know, I told them, well, I make enough money as an airline pilot. I can, you know, I can do this on my side time and I'm a volunteer and I don't need to charge anybody. Um, and I, I find this very interesting and it's good for the, uh, uh, I said, it's good for the organization and the, and the, um, uh, the, uh, a pilot of N7AP interrupted me says, well, you're doing it for the benefit of humanity. And I go, well, I don't quite look at it quite like that, but okay, whatever. It was kind of interesting because that, that airplane, uh, I talked about N7AP, AP stands for autopilot. It was used by the FAA to certify the original autopilot on the DC-3. Yeah. Well, you know DC-3s have been around a long time, so that's uh, that's how long this airplane had been around. But as you all know, you know, you all are familiar with this equation, you know, that commercial. Um, 500 feet, the assi at, given the size of this array and the frequency we're operating in, I mentioned uh, to several of the engineers, I said, well, you guys are compensating for the fact that we're in the near field and the, and the uh, wave front hasn't fully developed. So, you know, we're, we're getting questionable, uh, questionable data as far as the true field intensity. And we're not really measuring what, you know, the established field would be at greater distances. Because I said, you know, we're in the near field and, so, you know, we're, uh, we're not even in the Fresnel range. So uh, they kind of looked at me and go, hmm, maybe this isn't just some dumb airline pilot. And they kind of scratched their head and says, you know, you're right. We got to take that into account. Well, like I mentioned, there are some really intense sources around the country. And that's just our country. Places where you don't want to be with an airplane. And this is Goldstone out in Southern California, very near Air Edwards when I flew. And they, they told us to, uh, to stay away from it, even though we were flying, uh, authorized to fly in the restricted areas. You know, the, the way you take care of something that you don't want people to get near is you put it in a restricted area. And well, Goldstone's in a restricted area, so uh, commercial aircraft are not going to be penetrating this. Because if the thing about Goldstone is um, they are a deep space network. And if you want to talk to a satellite that's way the far out there, you know, Pioneer 1011, 
uh, Voyager, things like that, you need a lot of power and you need a very focused, intense beam. This is not something you want to fly through with your aircraft. I mean, uh, if you got steel cables, yeah, you're probably all right. But if you've got uh, electronics that can be messed up, then you don't want it. And here's Buckley. Uh, they've got, uh, they're now Space Command and that, but they, they had some pretty intense uh, emitters out there too, and you wanted to stay away from there. Well, as I mentioned, I was chairman of the uh, AE4R Radiated Environment Data Accuracy Committee, and I put together um, a paper for SAE and presented it uh, back in 1990. That's how long ago this was. And as part of our work, we established various uh, field intensity levels, let's put it that way, uh, that uh, an aircraft could possibly be exposed to. And there's the, uh, these are just the last couple of pages of the report that kind of talk about, you know, what field intensity we felt it should be um, uh, checked to, tested to. Now, my understanding, and, and I worked on this for 10 years, and then I turned it over to somebody else, and they flailed with it for quite a few other years. Uh, my understanding was that they were going to have a uh, FAR. It was going to be 1,400-something uh, that dealt with this. But uh, what they do, like the FAA does a lot of time, they come out with an advisory circular. circular said, well, you don't have to do it this way, but the kind of the thing is, if you know how uh, the feds work is, uh, if you don't follow the advisory circular, you've got to show us uh, some other way that you have compliance. And generally, that's not going to be easy. So yeah, follow the AC, even though it's not uh, mandatory. But if you don't, yeah, not so good. So the advisory circular, they, they took our uh, graph that's not the easiest to work with and they made it tabular. So it's uh, easier to hand to a technician and say, hey, this frequency, this intensity level, depending on what you want to do. And that will uh, allow you to test the aircraft and um, establish that they are safe. Well, this has been, you know, right now over 30 years and it has proved um beneficial the initial some of the initial field intensities were you know we were being too careful they they were a little too intense i'll admit now they were they were too intense we were, we were trying to err on the safe side but some of the field intensities got so uh strong that you couldn't have anybody in the aircraft because the field intensities were too strong so yeah you shouldn't be there anyway but they've uh they backed off a bit and made a more reasonable and uh Things have apparently worked out. We haven't had any uh, events that I've been aware of due to electromagnetic interference. So that's a little bit of the history of the AE4R committee, if you're wondering. And if any of my strictly aviation people have stayed this long, God bless you. Anyway, thanks for watching.